Good morning, church. To be together. We have a new tradition we started about two years ago. Every time someone's baptized in service, uh, we actually all stand up, give them a round of applause, and welcome in. So stand up. Let's give them a round of applause. So for Corey and Kayla, it's awesome. Uh, awesome. Great to have you. Great, great to uh, have you as a part of our church and uh, just a part of the overall group of Jesus followers. I know that made you feel awesome and embarrassed, and you can deal with me later on that one. So they, uh, but it's just a tradition, and, and not all traditioners are bad traditions. Some traditions are phenomenal. Uh, today, we are moving along in this New Year series that we've started called Habits. Habits. We believe that there are particular habits that we can adopt that will greatly encourage us in our journey with Jesus greatly encourage us, our habits. I mean, some of us, for some of us, it's sometimes we, we, kinda, we kinda are what we do. You know, it's because of who we are which produces why we do what we do. Who we are, why we do what we do, and it moves in this pattern. A, a couple years ago, I, I, I woke up one morning and I went down into our living room. It was pretty early in the morning and I had a good cup of coffee and I sat down in this kind of old uh, lazy boy recliner. It's not like one of those big recliners, it's like one of those ones that have like the, the wood on the side so it's like, it just fits like, it just fits you. Uh, you're not gonna fall asleep in it, but, but it's, it's just comfortable. And it's this recliner that we've had for a number of years. This recliner has a, a special meaning to my wife, Addie, and I. It was the recliner that we bought to put in our girls' nurseries. So when they were little, we would sit there and we'd rock them to sleep, and then we'd place them to the crib. So we, we both have like an emotional attachment to this recliner. So it'll probably be in our house until the day that we die. I mean, we just can't, we can't throw it away. Maybe you have some things like that. So I'm sitting in this chair, got myself a good cup of coffee, and I have a couple books that I'm going to dive into, and I decide that I'm going to begin, before I read anything, I'm going to start by praying. And it wasn't but 30 seconds in that I started thinking about things that, that did not matter. And so I said, no, all right, all right, let's focus. And then I started thinking about something else that didn't matter. And I realized that I'm thinking about a thousand different things right now when I'm trying to pray, and none of them make total sense. You ever have that happen to you? You know, I get to a place where I'm like, okay, I'm going to pray. Like, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray about things. I'm going to be grateful to God. I'm going to pray. And then all of a sudden, I get to a, a particular spot, and my mind goes like a thousand different places. This morning, I woke up to pray, and I started to pray, and the first thing on my mind was, why are the Browns so bad? You know, and I was like, no, 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 focus. Uh, why does Greg Newsom, why is he either getting burnt or celebrating like he just won the Super Bowl? Why, cannot we, why can't we trade him? You know, and I'm thinking through all these, oh, no, no, focus, focus. I wonder how cold it is. I wonder if people will come to church even though it's negative 15. I wonder if people in Columbus realize that it's January and it's going to snow and it's going to get cold. Why are we all so shocked? And I'm just like, pray, pray, pray. I think we all struggle to pray. I mean, we put ourselves all in that boat. We struggle to pray. You know, sometimes we struggle in prayer because, um, you know, we just haven't done it in a while. You know, so we feel like there's this distance between us and God, and so, you know, we, we kind of feel a little bit guilty. You know, so, sometimes I think we struggle in prayer because, you know, we just, we have so much going on in our lives that we, we really don't know how to kind of calm our mind and our heart and our soul down, to just, to just kind of be, you know, for five or 10 minutes or even two minutes, to not be so distracted. I think sometimes, I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes I struggle in prayer because, because I'm trying to hide something from God. You know, that, that, that I'm pretending that I'm not, but deep down, like, you know, it's either something that I've done or something that I don't want to come to terms with that I'm, I'm just kind of keeping to myself. And I'm like, God, you can have all this, but you, no, I'm not ready for you to have that. You know, and I find myself hiding from God. Over the last few months, I, I don't know why, but I've just been fascinated with going back to, to the creation account in the, the early part of the book of Genesis. You know, after Adam and Eve decide to disobey God, what do they do? They hide. They hide, and God comes, and he says, why, why are you hiding? And Adam says, well, I heard you. I was afraid, so I hid. And I think sometimes our, our prayers are distracted because there's a part of us or something taking place in my life that I, I just want to hide from God, like he doesn't know. 
You know, sometimes I, I think I struggle in prayers because there, there's some, something that, that's taking place in my life that I'm just not at peace with. You know, maybe something that's taking place with uh, somebody I love or a family member. Maybe there's just something that, that, that has happened and I'm like, I don't, know how, I, I don't know how to make sense of this. You know, we all struggle with prayer. We all struggle with prayer. You know, there's been a ton of research done on prayer and the prayer life of Jesus' followers. And, and uh, most research studies that you look at say that the average follower of Jesus prays less than five minutes a day. Which, I mean, we get that, right? Less than five minutes a day we spend in prayer. You know, I mean, given the pace of life that most of us are trying to live at, we, we get that. But what is it about? What is it about our heart and our soul, our mind, who we are, that, that keeps us distracted in prayer? First and foremost, we're all in the same boat. So let's just, let's just conclude that. We're all in the same boat. This is a struggle for all of us. But we also can come to see that the habit of prayer, the practice of prayer, is something that can, really, that can really help me draw closer to Jesus and definitely be more at peace in this craziness called life, this crazy thing called life. You know, even Jesus' disciples, they, they struggled with prayer. They struggled with prayer. Now, I realize when I say prayer that, that we can have multiple, multiple definitions of prayer. So I think before we jump into Luke chapter 11, which is where we're going to be today, I, I think it's important that we, that we kind of come up with a workable definition of prayer. The best definition of prayer that I've heard was about 10 years ago when somebody said, don't overcomplicate prayer. Prayer is simply conversation with God. It's conversation with God. You know, I think it's easy to overcomplicate prayer. I, I'm blessed to do life with a, with a lot of guys in our community. And I'm able to, to hang out with them and to meet with them, go to ball games with them, to you know, grab meals with them, to watch ball games with them. And every once in a while, I'll get in a conversation about prayer with, with a guy that I do life with. And most of the time, when we talk about prayer, they'll confess one or two things. They'll say, I just feel stupid because I don't know how to pray. Or I'm afraid that when I pray, I'm not going to do it right. So a prayer is simple converse, simply conversations with God. What, what's the right way and what's the wrong way? I'm not quite sure if there is an exact right way or there is an exact wrong way. You know, we know that, that prayer, that prayer, while it's difficult because we're so easily distracted, that, that prayer is not some like rub the genie in the bottle and you get three wishes type of thing. That's not what prayer is. That prayer is not an opportunity for God to tell me all the things that I'm doing wrong. That's not what prayer is. That prayer is actually a very gracious invitation into conversation with our one true God. That's what prayer is. The disciples struggled to know how to pray, to know when to pray, to know where to pray, and so they decided they were going to ask Jesus. So let's go to Luke chapter 11. Today we'll begin in verse 1. The Gospel of Luke chapter 11 is simply titled, Jesus' Teaching on Prayer. Verse 1, it says this, one day Jesus was praying, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. Now let's stop there real quick, let's kind of set the scene here. Uh, the vision of our church is what? Does anybody know the vision of our church? Follow Jesus together. So maybe this is your first Sunday that, that you've ever been to this church, and you did what a lot of people do. You jumped on our website to say, hey, I want to see about this church. I want to find information about this church. I want to make sure this church isn't crazy. And when you jumped on the website, hopefully you saw this big vision statement, follow Jesus together. We're a church that believes the best way to live is to follow Jesus that Jesus is the one and only son of the one and only true God. He left us an example of a life that is honoring to God. And then he went to the cross to die on the cross for the forgiveness of our sin. And then three days later, he defeated death so that death could no longer have a hold on us. And anybody who chooses to trust in Jesus as the son of God will have, exactly as John 3, 16 says, will have eternal life, a forever relationship with God because of what Jesus has done for us. But the whole idea to follow Jesus and then the two, to do that together is to follow the example of Jesus. I believe the best way we can grow in our relationship with Jesus is first by praying. By praying, by having conversations with Jesus. Second is to read the Bible. To read the Bible, to read, to spend time reading scripture. And I know this sounds very Sunday school oriented, Hey, how do you grow in your relationship with Jesus? You pray and read the Bible. 
I mean, any second grader back there in our kids' ministry right now could probably give you those answers. But it's conversations with Jesus. It's reading about Jesus. And then third, we cannot leave out the third. Third is to love our neighbor. So I have conversations with Jesus, I read about Jesus, and then I love the people that surround me. That's how I grow in my relationship with Jesus. But so often when we read the Bible, we become overwhelmed. And the best way to read the Bible is, is realizing that you're probably never going to have it all figured out. You're not going to have the answers to everything that the Bible has. Every single one of us is going to be confused at times when we read the Scripture. But the best way to read the Bible is, is slowly. Just read it slow. It's quality over quantity. You know, some of you all made the New Year's resolution to read the Bible in a year. Good luck with that. Good luck with that. You will be overwhelmed. Now, I'm not saying give up. You will be overwhelmed. Start with reading the New Testament in a year. That's about a chapter a day. But when we get to Luke chapter 11, verse 1, slow down for a sec. It says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. So what day of the week is it? Any day. I mean, it doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell us that a Saturday or a Sunday. It could be Monday. It could be Tuesday. It could be Thursday. Whatever. So follow Jesus. Any old day is a good day to pray. Jesus is praying. Jesus is in conversation with God. Where does Jesus go to have conversation with God? A certain place. It doesn't say he's at the temple. It doesn't even say he's in the temple courts. It says that he is in a certain place. Follow Jesus. Follow Jesus together. So if Jesus went to certain places to be in conversation with God, I have to ask myself the question, Jay, do you have certain places that you go to get alone with God, to be in conversation with God, in the midst of the hustle and bustle and all the craziness, and then your own distracting mind, do I have certain places that I go to converse with God? You see, so often I think we overcomplicate prayer. We overcomplicate it. By overcomplicating it, we kind of remove it from our, our journey with Jesus, or we degrade it, or we only do it every so often, or we overcomplicate it because we get afraid we're going to do it right or we're going to do it wrong. But let's just keep it simple. In the old day, Jesus had conversation with God in a certain place. Jesus had a certain place. Do you? You know, for you, maybe this is a, a chair in your house somewhere, or, you know, a corner, a reading corner in your apartment. You know, maybe it's a, a park that you go to. You know, a couple times every winter, I, I go up to High, Bank, High Banks, because nobody's there in the wintertime. It's freezing out. But I go to High Banks, and I just sit in the parking lot, and I hang out in my truck. If it's warm, I'll take a walk. If it's cold, I'll just stay in the truck. It's a certain place that I go to experience God, to have conversation with God. Jesus had a certain place. He exemplifies this for us. Do you have a certain place where you go to converse with God? I think it's best practices, no doubt. And so Jesus is praying in this certain place, and then it continues on in verse 1. It says, when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, Lord, teach us to pray just as John, that's John the Baptist, taught his disciples how to pray. You know, I love this about the disciples because they're just like us. They're insecure. They're like, I've struggled with prayer. It's not that the disciples have never prayed up to this point. It's just they've struggled with it. And they figure, hey, we believe Jesus is the Son of God, so perhaps Jesus knows the best way to be in conversation with God. And so they just simply ask. They ask. And Jesus could have said anything that he wanted to say about prayer, but yet this is what Jesus has to say to his disciples. He said to them, verse 2, said to them, when you pray, say, Father, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. How many of you wanted to add words to that prayer? You know, you, you might have grown up, you know, in a family or a church that, that taught the Lord's Prayer. And there's all these different words that have been added to the Lord's Prayer. Now, the Lord's Prayer shows up. This is what is referred to as the Lord's Prayer. It shows up in Luke chapter 11, but also in Matthew chapter 6. You might like Matthew chapter 6 a little bit better because it's got a couple more of those words that you and I grew up with. I remember when I was a little kid, my mom and my grandmother, they, they taught me the Lord's Prayer. 
And so every night before bed, my sister and I would get with my, my mom. I grew up in a single parent household and we would say the Lord's prayer for years. It's the only time I prayed and was the only prayer that I knew was the Lord's prayer. And I learned it more, and my, my grandmother was a deaconess. She was a female servant for the Presbyterian church. And so she, it was more of a formal church for sure. And so it, we kind of learned it in like old school King James. So it was like, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And we add all these things to it. The Lord's Prayer. Jesus could have chose anything any example for prayer, but this is what he chose. I I came to Jesus as as a high school student. Um, I didn't grow up in in an overly churched family. You know, my grandmother knew Jesus. She helped out at her church. We would go there some. Uh, My parents got divorced when I was about four years old, and that, that, you know, divorce is never great. Um, So that kind of created some complications in our family, and you know, I was raised uh, with a single parent, my single mom, just my sister and I. I have a sister that's almost three years older than I was. And so eventually, my mom decided that she wanted to, to get us involved in a church. And so there was a church right down the street from this apartment complex that I spent like 10 years of my childhood growing up. And so my mom just started going to this church. And it was a, it was a good church. It was a really, really good church. And so we'd go to church. My sister had no interest in church. Therefore, I had no interest in church. So basically, my mom had to force us to go to church uh, every couple weeks. I wanted nothing to do with Jesus. But when I was in high school, things kind of changed for me. And, and I came to, to my own decision about who I believe Jesus to be. And as a high school student, I mean, I remember I gave my life over to Jesus, which was a complete 180 for me. Growing up, I uh, you know, I was, I was the most rebellious kid in our class. I mean, hands down. I'd been in more trouble by the time I was like 15 years old than most people in their lifetime. I, I look back on my childhood and you're like, well, how bad could you have been? I'm not going to confess everything today. You know, that'd take a while, but man, I was into some stuff I shouldn't have been into. Definitely. You know, I look at it, I probably led our class in detentions. I know, I know I led our class in forced community service. You see, I grew up in this little suburb east of Akron called Talmadge, and anytime you got got caught in trouble, like doing something you definitely should have done, they made you do community service, forced community service. Here's what you had to do. If it was wintertime, you had to wash police cars on Saturday morning for six hours. If it was nice out, you had to go to one of the local parks or the, or the uh, high school football stadium and pick up trash. I cannot tell you how many times I had to do that, forced to do that because I got in trouble. I, I look back, I love to go to, to basketball games, love to go to middle school and high school basketball games because that was the sport I loved, but I was vertically challenged, so it just didn't work out for me. And so uh, I remember seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, and 10th grade, I led our team in technical fouls. <laughs> technical fouls. I'll never forget this. When I decided to come to Jesus, like two weeks later, the preacher of our church, I was baptized on a Sunday night in like this youth group. I decided to go all in and the preacher of our church was there and our youth pastor was there who was a football coach. But I'll never forget this. About two weeks, I've been following Jesus for two weeks. And a preacher knew that was a big turnaround for me. And he, he came to one of my basketball games. And I'll never forget this, this team, it was uh, Revere, Revere High School, which is Bad Township, Northeast Ohio. All of a sudden, they threw a press on us, like out of the blue. They never pressed. They always fell back into a 2-3 zone. They threw this press on us, and I tried to beat the press, and I passed this ball. I mean, I launched it like 100 feet out of bounds. And when I did that, I yelled out a curse word. I was just, oh. And all of a sudden, they caught a technical foul. And the ref brings me over to the bench. The preacher of our church is sitting with my mom in the second row, and our coach goes, what's the technical foul for? And he said, number 10 said, bloop. And I looked at my preacher, I was like, eh. (laughs) When I came to follow Jesus, I had no idea how to follow Jesus, and I definitely didn't know how to pray. The only prayer I'd ever said was the Lord's Prayer. Our youth pastor, who was a football coach, he gave me this reading plan through the Gospel of Matthew. And he's like, read through the Gospel of Matthew. So I started reading through the Gospel of Matthew. Have you ever read the Gospel of Matthew? First thing you come to, what is it? The genealogy of Jesus. And so it's all these random Old Testament names, half of which you have no idea. You're like, is this in tongues? Like, is this gibberish? What is Abinadad, Salmon, Boaz, all these names. I'm like, what in the world is going on here? Thankfully, from there, it gets into the birth accounts. 
of Jesus. And so you get familiarity because they're like Christmas scriptures that you go, you know, you hear about when you go to church around Christmas time. So I started to feel familiar with the gospel. And then you get into Matthew 4. Matthew 3 is the baptism of Jesus. Matthew 4 is the testing of Jesus. And then 5, 6, and 7 is Jesus' first public teaching. And in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus talks about prayer. And it's the first time that we see this Lord's Prayer. But it says there, when you pray, say. All right, so I'm a high school boy who just decided to follow Jesus, and so I took Jesus at his words. So every time I prayed for six months, I said the Lord's Prayer every time I prayed because I thought I had to. But that was not Jesus' point. You see, prayer is not a have to. It's not a have to. It's not something that, that we're meant to feel like we fall short of in our relationship with Jesus. Prayer is a get to. Because of what Jesus has done for us, we get to have open and honest conversation with the Almighty God. Prayer is a privilege. First and foremost, prayer is a privilege. And it's not meant to be something that judges us. We'll talk about what prayer does here in a second, but I want you to know this. When Jesus gives his example of prayer, he absolutely makes it personal. Why? Because he starts by saying this. When you pray, say, Father, Father. That line, that word right there would have blown the disciples' minds. It's not that the disciples had never prayed. I mean, they were God-fearing young men. But they would have seen addressing God as Father as too impersonal and too irreverent. But Jesus came to change the game. Jesus came to change the game for us to know that God, the Father, wanted to be in forever relationship with us. So he's like, when you pray, address him personally as your Father because that's exactly who he is. So when we come into prayer, we pray to a God who cares for us deeply and wants to hear from us knowing that we are imperfect, we don't have it all figured out, that we're probably going to say some things in prayer that are a little bit empty, but we're also going to be led to say some things in conversation with God that, that come from the very core of our soul, from the depths of our being, things that we're struggling with, things that we're grateful with, and things that we are torn up about. You see, when we come to look at prayer, we see first and foremost that prayer is meant to be conversational. Then we see that prayer is meant to be personal, but more, we see that prayer is meant to be transformational. It's meant to be transformational. You see, the power of prayer is not so much in that it changes things. Prayer does change things. The power of prayer is that it changes me. It changes me. And so Jesus offers this model that we know as the Lord's Prayer, and he says, hey, look, start. When you pray, say, Father. It's personal. It's conversational. It's powerful. Father, Great is your name. That's hallowed. Hallowed is your name. Your kingdom come, which is an admission that, God, your way is better than mine. Even when I look upon a situation and I say, I wish it wouldn't be this way, your way is better than mine. Your purpose is more, than pur more important than my purpose. The way that you th see things and how they should be is better than the way that I think they should be. And as a follower of Jesus, the Lord's prayer leads me to that. Your kingdom come. Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Jesus is saying, it's okay to pray for things that you need. It's okay to pray for things that you need. God knows that you need them. And it's a personal prayer. God, I need this. God, I need that. You know, there's going to be times that God said, no, no you don't. And there's going to be times that God says, I agree with you. You do need that. And then there's, there are going to be times that God says, you just need to wait on that. You need to wait on that. Give us this day our daily bread and I'll forgive us. Because every single one of us falls short. But also, as you forgive us, help us to forgive other people. Because Jesus knew that it was hard to forgive other people. 
You know, I, I took a, uh, uh, an inventory test. It was like this spiritual instrument that they give uh, pastors from uh, a group called the Blessing Ranch, which is a phenomenal ministry uh, down in Florida that works with pastors throughout, throughout the country about their own spiritual health. And, and they asked me to be a part of this like research survey instrument thing that they were doing. And I had, to, I had to fill out like, it was like 80 questions about my own personal health, my own spiritual health. And, and I filled out all these questions and they shot this report back at me and I met with one of their people, one of their leadership coaches. And it was crazy. There was this list of like 10 spiritual health traits that they shot back at me. And my, my first one was resilient. They said, you are a very resilient person. You can take a lot of punishment. And I'm like, I don't know how to take that. But they said, you're resilient. The second one was compassionate. And I thought, oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have guessed that. And I said, well, and then the last one was mercy. And I was like, well, how can my second top one be compassion and my last one be mercy? And they said, well, compassion is the ability to put yourself in somebody's shoes. Mercy really is all about forgiving other people. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. That's true. Forgiveness is hard. And for some of us, it's really hard. For whatever it is, there's something in us that builds loyalty. And then when somebody crosses that line, it's really, really, really hard to forgive them. Jesus knew that. That's why he included that in this model of prayer. You see, our prayers can be affected when we're unwilling to forgive. We're unwilling to forgive. Jesus knew that. He included that. And then he said this, lead us not in temptation. Now, don't be confused. God doesn't lead us into temptation. God knows that we are easily tempted, that we are easily tempted. So he said, do not feel afraid to ask for God's help when you, are, when you are in a place of temptation. It's so practical because it's conversational, it's personal, and it's transformational. The power of prayer. When I allow myself to have conversations with God, it changes me, changes me. That's the power of prayer. You know, a habit is developed when we place a certain level of importance on something, right? I mean, maybe you have these New Year's resolutions or goals where you're going to eat better. You buy into science that says you are what you eat. So if you go to McDonald's, you eat that, even though we all love McDonald's. Don't act like you don't. You're going to feel like McDonald's. And it, that if you eat a salad with good protein on it, you're going to feel like a salad with protein on it. And so we start to develop a habit when we realize that something's very important and it benefits us. You know, that's why a lot of us, we, we go to bed relatively at the same time and we wake up at the same time because we know that our body, our mind, that our heart, that we need rest. And so we create these habits, habits of exercise, habits of communication. Maybe you, you spend time with friends because you know it's beneficial for you to be in community. Maybe you go out on dates because you know that it, it, it's, uh, it's beneficial to spend time with your significant other or your spouse. You know, this past Friday, uh, we went to see a comedian down at uh, Nationwide. This guy named Nate Bargazzi. Half of you guys were there. We saw everybody and their mother from church. And the guy's hilarious. He's clean and he's hilarious. But just to sit there and to laugh with somebody that you're friends with, what is that? That's a habit that speaks to your soul. It's good for you. We eat because we need food. We sleep because we need rest. We spend time with friends because we need companionship. We pray because you fill in the blank. Nobody can answer that question for you. I pray because. Why do you pray? Why don't you pray? Prayer is an irreplaceable habit in our journey with Jesus. Just walk into it. Walk into it. Try it. Say, tomorrow I develop the habit of prayer at 7 a.m. for five minutes. Begin to develop habits and conversation with God. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you give us the opportunity to pray. Lord, we are blessed because of it, because it brings us in community, communion, and communication with you. Lord, thank you that you did. You modeled it. And it wasn't a liturgical model that says, every time you pray, this is exactly what you're to say. No, you modeled that for us because prayer is personal. Prayer is conversational, and prayer is absolutely transformational. The power of prayer is not so much, Lord, that it changes all the things around me. It does do that. But the power of prayer is that it changes me into your image and your likeness. 
Thank you for the gift of prayer. Give us your strength as we develop these habits that help us become more like your son, Jesus. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.